came out, but I knew all of those guys that did the flying. In fact, two of them were my students. Ustai Polanko was 9.6, and he's blubbering. He's, he, he, he's, he's gone. Seeing an airplane that got hit by another airplane, lost part of the wing. Now I put the backseaters to sleep a couple times. <laughs> really? <laughs> that was a funny story. That's the only part of the movie that is not real in my mind. He lights up a cigarette, puts his arms out on the windstream. He says, okay, you got it. It's pretty hardcore. It is. So I pulled the trigger again. Whoosh, there goes the other one. I shouldn't laugh, but it was kind of funny. You should tell that story, even if it's not true. <laughs> yeah. Those are the days. So what years were you in the F-14? 76, 75, something. And then I got out in 85. Pretty close. Most guys currently flying are unlikely to have been born when the movie was made, the original movie. But you were actually done and out about the time of the movie came out, or was it overlapped? The, the movie came out after I got out, but I knew all of those guys that did the flying. In fact, two of them were my students. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Lloyd Abel Bozo, he was in my back seat at the, when I went to, aboard the ship the first time at night. And uh, he ended up transitioning to the pilot program and he did the, the, the high speed tower flyby. Okay, <laughs> for the movie. Bozo, yeah, all those guys I know, Dave Baranek, uh, yeah, everybody. Well, I imagine Good. it's a pretty small world. Or you know everybody in it almost. Yes, the East Coast, of course, they had their own. Okay. And then there was the West Coast side. So pretty much everybody on the West Coast I knew or knew of or trained or the fleets would go out, would, would alternate. There would always be somebody in the Pacific. And I was part of the seventh fleet, CAG 11. So, you know, CAG 2 would come, we'd come in, CAG 2 would go out. So sometimes we would never see each other. Carrier Air Group? Yeah. Okay. And what made you choose the Navy over the Air Force? Good question. Um... I tried for the Air Force Academy first, not knowing that the Navy had airplanes, and then uh, found out a guy, uh, Mike Chamberlain, said, hey, I'm going to go to the Navy and fly. I go, no, no, that's the Air Force. Um, it, it comes down to the Navy had tactical airplanes much more prevalent than the Air Force. They had you know, all the big equipment and the heavy flying, and right. I just didn't think I was, would enjoy that to be snobbish about it. Right, that makes sense. And it worked out very well for me. We started off by having, you could be um, of jets, props, or helos. That was the only three combinations that, that when you go through training that you had to put down, what do you want, jets, props, or helos? Okay. One, two, and three, in the order that you want them. So, what did I put down? Jets, jets, jets. If I didn't get jets, what was the point of it? Right. <laughs> I said something about earlier about Officer and a Gentleman, and in that movie, the guy is making a late life choice to go into the Navy and fly jets, which seems unlikely to me. It seems like you probably wouldn't know most of your life that you wanted to fly if you were doing that for a living. Like, would, how, long, how old were you when you knew you wanted to fly? Four. What was your first exposure to flight? Flew from Lewiston and Clarkston, which is the Idaho, Washington side. And then from there, we flew across the Atlantic to uh, eventually to North Africa, where we, at age four, that's where I lived. Oh, really? And they allowed you to go into the cockpit, and it was, well, 1956. It was, all that stuff was really brand new. High altitude flying, jets, the whole bit. And they, they allowed us to go in the cockpit, and I'm looking around. And I mean, it really, I remember it distinctly. Only God could know all of these button styles, switches, and everything else. It was really intimidating. So I looked very highly upon the, the pilot for when I was a kid. Right. <laughs> so I was four when I said, I think that looks pretty cool. Where was your first light plane? Did anybody ever take you up in a small plane? I learned how to fly in college at age okay. 17. I, uh, there was a, a pamphlet that comes underneath the doors in the dorm Everybody had to stay in the dorm back then. And uh, it said, learn to fly at, at one-third the cost. So I wrote to my dad, 
didn't have cell phones, didn't have long distance. We could have, but it was expensive. Wrote to my dad, said, hey, here's the cost for a private pilot's license. How about it? Well, I, you can't say no unless you ask. And my dad was very, very serious. He was very, the, that time frame of right. dads. And he wrote back and he said, here's the deal. I'll pay for it if you get your pilot's license. If you don't get your pilot's license, if you don't complete, you pay me every penny back. This is a no-brainer. Right. This is, I cannot believe that my father would say that. So I got my pilot's license at 433 bucks, I think it was. So I walk out to the three and a half miles, walk out there, didn't have a car, and out to the airfield. And I walk into the FBO office there, and he walks out and he hands me this green flight suit. He says, yeah, you got to wear that. It's, it's fire retardant. I go, fire retardant? <laughs> Why do I need that? What do we do? And he says, I'll come down and sit over here. And he hands me this, this other thing. And he says, this is your parachute. <laughs> We're wearing a parachute <laughs> with a fire retardant? I said, this is going to be cool. <laughs> and he hands me a helmet. I get a helmet and a mic. I said, oh, man, this is just, this is... This is really cool. So then he sits down and he goes over the litany, the NATOPS litany of the bold face items, which have to be memorized. Every airplane, you, you, you can't go to the checklist. You've got to memorize these things. He goes, okay, so if you have to bail out, I'm going to do this. And he goes, go. This guy is just God to aviation. So we jump into the airplane and he helps me plug in, strap on a strap across their shoulders and he tights it all down and I felt like I was part of the machine and he starts it up and he does all the checklists over the ICS and, and he's talking away and I'm thinking, man, this is nothing like I was ever taught. <laughs> and we take off and no sooner we get airborne, I see the gear handle come up and you can feel the gear and click, click, click and I see all the three up, up, up. The canopy, the, there's the front one is independent of the back one. The front canopy slides open. Wham! I mean, you know, we're, the ground's right there. And he lights up a cigarette, puts his arms out in the windstream, and he says, okay, you got it. I'm going, this guy is truly God to aviation. And that's how it started. I said, I don't care what happened. I'm, I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do. And I found out that he's just a flunky. Right. That was nothing. <laughs> so that was, yeah. I was hooked. It's a big moment when you see somebody doing what it is you know that you want to do for the rest of your life. So. Yeah. Well, it really is. Yeah. I, I, mean, I didn't know I was going to do that for the rest of my life until I saw how cavalier and how professional he was. It was just to the nth degree professionalism oozed it. But he was just so cavalier about it. It was just it was like, wow. And that's really how naval aviation was. I was very fortunate to fly with some really, really talented, very, very top-notch people. Going back to the first movie a little bit, since you got out just around that same time, it seemed almost at the time like a recruiting film, and I think it was done in partnership with the Navy, not as a recruiting film, but it helped the image of the Navy, and it did help with recruiting, so indirectly. Oh, absolutely. Oh, it, would, it was a, a smash hit right from the get-go. Very well done, technically pretty accurate. Of course, as you mentioned before, the airplanes are not that close. Right. You know, they had to have Hollywood involved so people could see the airplanes. But when you're in a dogfight, they're just a tiny little dot. And, and, and they're, you have to have good spatial awareness of where everything is happening. I've, yeah, I would imagine everything that happens in the movie is condensed in space in order to make it more that's watchable. A, that's a better way of saying it. But that everything in reality, is, is it beyond visual range usually, or is it at visual range? Or the, I mean, uh, do the you dog, normally see visually? Or the dogfight's all visual. Okay. And, of course, the uh, missile shooting was not, but that was not what you needed to practice for. You'd get the lock everything up on radar, and, and uh, the other guy would be coming up, and, and as soon as you got to the firing solution, you'd press the button. How hard is that? Now, depending on like an SR-71, that's really difficult. But a MiG-15 or 17 or an A-4, it's not that difficult. So there was the training of that wasn't all that intense. But you get mixed up with you and uh, two other airplanes, bad guys. 
In the movie, the enemy is never identified, but they claim to be flying MiG-28s, which are actually F-5s, I believe. In the first movie? Yeah. They were actually F-5s, yes. My question is, what do they use F-5s for besides pretending to be enemies? That's what they use them for. That is it? Yeah, primarily. the Navy. Okay. Yeah, the Air Force has those airplanes for training. But the, the, the Navy, obviously, it's not a shipboard airplane. Right. I shouldn't say obvious, but it's not a shipboard yeah, airplane. Yeah, now you mentioned it, it's clearly not. Yeah. Little spindly gears, no tail hook. The kind of, well, actually, I'm going to jump around a bit. I'm going to say that, since we're talking about shipboard planes, Robert McNamara had tried to unify all the branches to get them to adopt, I think, the F-111. But that's an enormous aircraft, and it might have served, you know, either one of the branches really well, but it didn't seem like a good fit for the Navy. And that's kind of what the F-14 was growing out of, if I'm correct. That's correct. The F-111 was, was supposed to be utilized in the Navy. But I think the max landing weight or, or the, um, the gross was like 73 or 74,000. And, and they just had to redo all the ships in order to handle that. Okay. Plus taking off with the catapult, had to redo all that. It just wasn't feasible for carrier. And the big... The, the big difference was that they somebody figured out how to weld um, titanium. The 111 was steel or okay. iron in order for the for the wings. Right. But for the the F14, they had this great big titanium hollow block that was inside with fuel and pivots on each side for the for the wings. I've heard that the wings could get uh, geometrically out of sync and that you had to either... I've never seen that, but obviously no. anything's possible. So it wasn't a common occurrence then or anything? No. I've seen an airplane that got hit by another airplane, lost part of the wing. Still landed properly? Yeah, a little fast. <laughs> <laughs> the bubble canopy in the F-14 seems like, especially like you're sitting on top of the aircraft, the F-14 and the F-16 to me, if some of you sit down inside, but these ones like seem like you have a pretty good view. And is that part of the design or just a nice benefit? Or it was definitely part of the design. That was one of the big problems with uh, the World War II airplanes. Was it was too enclosing. If you look at the original P fifty one A or B, yeah, it probably comes up to here or something. It, like well, that. plus it's the turtle back. The, and, and, All right. And uh, now, and then the F P fifty one D had the little bubble, and that visibility was was tremendously advantageous to the pilot right the f-16 i have an hour and a half in that airplane was was the coolest airplane i ever flown it was it was a little toy now i have a question about that it's, it's a very high g platform so you can probably push nine g's if you're not careful and you can actually g lock yourself apparently if you're not paying attention and react too quickly because at least the avion the older avionics so if the aircraft is so maneuverable that it can produce those g loads why does it not win in air combat over say an f-15 uh, you need to be a little bit more specific. In a in a one-on-one, -on -one, um, an F-16 would, would probably win if it was clean. But if you put a drop tank on it in order for it to go anywhere, okay. you put a couple of bombs on there in order to have it utilized as a platform for something, it, now it's a dog. Right. And the same thing with the F-15 to a certain degree. F-14 likewise, all of them. Yeah, the, the bubble canopy on the F-14, uh, it, it was a big cockpit. And that was mainly for all the avionics and the, all the, the, the crap. They, it was a 1967 technology airplane. Right. And um, the back seat was clobbered too, which is also why they had the back seater to operate a lot of that stuff because it was all manual. And of course, nowadays, it's the F-15 and follow on the F-18 or they have a lot more automation. Um, it did have advanced tracking, to be honest. Like it could track six targets at one time. It could shoot six at a time. It could track 50. Oh, okay. I've heard it said that, yeah, it could shoot six, but they had to be like slow-moving, non-aggressive targets, and that if you really were engaging six multiple aggressive targets, it wasn't really capable of doing that. I have no idea. So the opinions <laughs> vary. What's the reality? The, the reality, we don't have any AIM-54s anymore. That uh, technology for the missiles is way advanced. So That's I'm the not, Phoenix? The, the Phoenix, yeah. Okay. The actual terminology we use, and I don't even sure where it came from, is F-pole. And you want to have the largest F-pole that you possibly can. And that's the distance that the two airplanes are apart when the missile hits. 
makes sense. Right. I want to have it as far as away. Well, the Sidewinder was a Mach 2.8, 2.5, 2.6, something like that, really fast. But it didn't go very far. So three miles, it was a, a small engine. But now the, the uh, Sparrow was a bigger airplane, uh, uh, missile. And um, we could shoot a Sparrow really accurately 20, 21 miles. But your F-pole was down to like eight miles. Okay. Or, or 10, I can't remember the exact number. It was fairly fairly narrow. So even though you got the first shot out, the other guy's coming in, he's gonna shoot at you, and you know you want the F-pull out there as far as you can. Right. And the new missiles are a lot faster. In the old olden days, I'm, I've heard that the missile effectiveness rate was somewhere around 30 to 40%. Um, which, which missile? I believe that's probably a Phoenix, because I, I don't know, it was long range. That's what they were saying, but because they're less maneuverable when they get in close, I'm guessing. The uh, yeah, the, the Phoenix you could shoot it 100, 110, uh, and it'd still it'd still get there. It cl it climbs and goes vertical up to I don't know what the altitude was 80, 90 thousand feet. So does the pounce thing where it gains a whole bunch of altitude and then comes down on the target? Yep, it's just you know one of those um, U shape. But if you're 100 miles away and you shoot a Phoenix, you could make a five degree turn and a missile ain't gonna make it. Right. You know, just just geometry. So we would wait till 30, 35 miles. The F pull on that was 30 miles. If you shot at 100, 110, something like that, if I remember correctly. So it's still the F pull was quite n narrow. I mean, short. We would wait till 30, 35 miles, I think was our sweet spot. Cause now the, the uh, other airplane didn't have enough maneuverability to get away from the Phoenix. I think it still could, but you've achieved your goal of getting rid of that airplane. Right. That's something I noticed in the movie. They do a lot of uh, aileron rolls to evade machine gun fire, which seems like you would be displacing it out of space, not trying to roll and evade. Uh, it looks good on film, but if, if somebody's close enough for guns, aren't you trying to actually just get away at that point? Or what, what are you doing at that point? You, you want to get out of plane. So if, uh, if, if, uh, if you're lined up like this, you're in plane. So if you see guns or you just don't even wait for you to see the guns, you just you make sure. Oh, so that's a valid thing then. You, yeah, you, you want to make sure you're, you're out of plane. So he's moving to try to contend, continue to be in plane. So the bullets go straight. Right. Missiles will follow you, but the bullets go straight. So no matter which three-dimensional move you want to make to make sure you get out of that plane of fire. That makes sense, doesn't it? It does. I did not know that you actually cared about it at that level of granularity. You know, why does it matter? If it's only a single cannon, why do you care if you're in plane? Because you'll get away quicker, or why does it matter? You're pulling Gs. Right. It's not just like this. And, well, if it was just like this you, and you turned you know, 10 feet, you know, the bullets are going to miss you. Right. But you, you're pulling Gs so that the, the bullets are actually in an arc. They come out, but you continue going, and, and they end up, in the direction that they originally shot. So when you're shooting another airplane, you're actually sh shooting way in front of them. Right. Do they use tracers in current? I never had a tracer. Stuff? Okay, so you can't see where you're shooting at all? No, they have you? tracers, but we didn't use them. Okay. Um, I don't know why that would be. They did in World War II, because that's the best aiming device that they had. Right. But we had um, the, the, the Gatling gun. <laughs> That was a lot of fun to shoot. It was, um, we had 600 bullets, and I think it shot 100, 100 rounds a second, something like that. It was unbelievable. It sounds about right. Oh, that, the gun was a lot of fun to shoot, 20 millimeter, and it, just, it was hydraulically operated. And it would take a, a few rounds to, to wind up, and then, okay. it, and then it would take a few rounds just to wind down. And we limited it to 50 round, I think. I remember picking the bird because the purge gas of the gunpowder couldn't clear the airplane in, in time, so you could easily get a fire in the airplane. Really? Yeah. So they limit us to 50. But obviously, if we were going to go out there and for real shooting somebody, to crank that thing up to unlimited. We had uh, limits on the engine. All rotor, our, our jet engines have limits. There's an RPM limit okay. and a, um, the temperature limits. We used TOT. Some engines use TIT, 
which is turbine inlet versus turbine outlet. The F-14 and the TF-30 P-14 was a, a TOT, the top turbine outlet, and that was limited to 1,020 degrees centigrade. And would there be any benefit if you needed to save your life and temporarily overriding that, or is it just that's how the engine works best? Well, you couldn't override it. Okay, you can't. No. On the stick, is in, I think in this movie they show that there's a paddle on the bottom of the stick to override the G-limits in the plane. Is that a thing in the F-14, or is that I don't F-14 know what it, I don't know where you got that. The, um, there was a paddle in the front on the F-14 that disconnected the autopilot. It disconnected everything. I think that's what I'm thinking of. So it was a real quick. You just hit the paddle, and you had total control of the airplane. And you could overstress it then at that point if you weren't well, careful? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I overstressed a lot of them. <laughs> what happens in that case? You write it up. There's a... Um, it's just like a, a beer can or a Coke can, aluminum, you bend it just a little bit. You can probably do that a hundred times, but if you go really far, you can only go like three or four times before it starts cracking. So you'd write it up and they'd keep track of that. And it, it, they'd only allow so many of those. And did they put the thing up on jack stands and check it out? or? Yeah, there was, yeah. There was that part of it too. I don't know the maintenance side of that, but right. yeah, they did, they did checks on it. Uh-huh. Yeah, the most I pulled length was 9.6. Well, that's a fair load. What aircraft was that in? F-14. Really? It hurt. <laughs> I can imagine. It hurt a lot. For how long? Were you sore the next day? Oh, God, yeah. Two days. You're sitting up like this in an F-14. In an F-16, you're laying down. So the Gs are transverse. Right. You know, they're going through you from, you know, chest to the back. Whereas the, the F-14 is from your head to your butt. And it, it really affects you a lot more. Compress your spine, too, then, I would guess, to a certain oh, yeah. extent. Yeah, everything. Yeah, oh, well, that wouldn't hurt. And I still lost, I think. I looked behind me, that F-15 was, I could still see his belly. Oh, still remember that. I, apparently, there's a 6.8 G limit in uh, F-14, unless you are hitting that thing that lets you do whatever you want to do. I don't understand that. Okay, maybe, that's a, to... maybe that's an older airplane. I mean, a newer airplane, but yeah, that could be F eighteen. I have no real. I know that uh, one of the aircraft allows you to overstress it, but that the avionics will prevent you, for, in most cases, from doing it accidentally. That sounds like an F sixteen. It's okay. all electronic. We had the stick was actually controlling a hydraulic valve. Well, it was in okay. an F fourteen. Center stick or side stick in an F fourteen. Center. But the electronic airplanes, it's all computer controlled. So you move the stick. Actually, in the F-16, the stick didn't even move. They actually had to make it move like an eighth of an inch because pilots couldn't get used to it. It's a, yeah, it I've a, heard that. It was, this is just a force, but it, then they had to add displacement to it, right? Just to give you a false feeling of movement. Right. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. That was a cool airplane. What's the primary difference, besides the, the input being different, versus an older flight? The craft like the 14. The weight, obviously the hydraulics was, and all the tubing and everything was a lot more weight than just a wire in a computer. Now the first, this could be the last time that we see a movie like this with actually recorded flight scenes because CG is getting good enough that soon yeah. they will, repl like if there's a Top Gun 3 in another 24 years, <laughs> I'm sure it will be computer generated. but. Uh, that's the thing I really appreciated about this movie was that all the flight scenes were actually recorded in flight. Whereas in the first movie, the uh, actors are never in the scene flying. Where in the second one, all flying scenes are recorded live with actors. I they do, did do some recording in the first movie, but it didn't make it into the film, apparently. Yeah, I do give uh, Tom Cruise a lot of credit for that. He said, hey, everybody has to feel what 6Gs is or 5Gs. And it, it does... <laughs> You can't act that one. Right. There is no way you can sit here and grunt and go, that's six Gs. Just, no. no. Yeah, you can see his face gets crushed, and he gets the actual effects of the G-load on it, so yeah. it looks very realistic, which is a nice touch, I think. Yeah, very nice. I, I enjoyed that, realistically. Yeah. But you could also, from my point of view, I could see that, that he was not flying. Because when you're flying, you anticipate, I'm going to turn right, so you anticipate. And then a guy in the back doesn't know I'm turning right, so when you turn right, his head goes the opposite direction. And you see that all through the, the Maverick movie that they're obviously not flying. Right, because <laughs> that makes sense. But to, to somebody that doesn't know that, I mean, they, would, right. they wouldn't see it. Or... 
And this G-lock thing, I've never heard of a pilot doing it. I think there has been. But you would relax your, your, your pull as soon as you, you started getting, unless you just snapped it on, I guess. Well, that's the story that I was hearing in another interview with an F-14 pilot who had flown the F-16 was that if you were startled by something and then just took an evasive maneuver without thinking it through, you could uh, G-lock yourself. And whether he was full of it or just hypothesizing, I, I, hypothesizing. Now, I've I'm put the sure. backseaters to sleep a couple times. <laughs> really? <laughs> That was a funny story. The, he was a Rio, the guy in the back, radar intercept officer, and uh, a little cocky, um, which is okay. And I think he had flunked out of pilot training and then, and then decided to stay in the aviation program, so he became a Rio. And he was in my back seat, and I, I can't remember the mission, what we were doing. And uh, I came into the break at Miramar, I, I don't know, I was like 500, 550, I don't know, it was pretty fast. And then snap rolled it, and he was busy talking to me about something. I can't remember what it was. And I, I snapped some, you know, as much cheese as I could on because I had to slow down. I couldn't fly over Kearneyville or Mesa or whatever that next town over. So you had to put a lot of G on to keep it from going. <laughs> and all of a sudden I hear him going, <laughs> and I look in the mirror and I see his head going up and down like this. And he's blubbering. He's, he, he, he's, he's gone. He is out. And then um, I get to the to the 90 position. He wakes up, and he was that's what he was reading airspeed. And uh, he he wakes up. And we're only doing 150. I had to gear down. The flaps were down. Get ready to land. He was still back there bobbing. <laughs> I hate this. <laughs> and he he wakes up and he says, his very last thought was you know 550 or whatever it was. So you know, that's what his, comes out 550. <laughs> and then he he realizes, oh wait a minute, he lost. You know, 10 seconds of his life. Yeah, I think in that case, you may not have any sense of the passage of time, but you know, no. all of a sudden you're in a completely different context and you're not sure why. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, but it was kind of funny. No, it was really funny. <laughs> um, is the personality of the Rio very different generally than the pilots? Because it seems like, I don't want to say you're second in charge, but it's just a different mentality. You're responsible for different things. I don't know who's responsible for navigation. It sounds like the pilot is responsible for navigation. Both. Okay. They, it's two different jobs. That's what I'm saying. So you different know, jobs, are they different people? It takes, no. Um, boy, so I, both I don't movies, know how to, to ask put a finer point on it, the, uh, both movies really focused on the egos of the pilots. And I'm wondering if the Rios are similar or are they a little more chill? That's the only part of the movie that is not real in my mind. That the, the confrontational, uh, the, the ego, the, you know, I'm better than you and, you know, the, the, the fight or the personality conflicts. I never saw that ever. It was always everybody working together. Right. And you knew the, the leak, the weak link, but you, you worked through that. You dragged it with you instead of beating up on them, saying they're idiots or, and I didn't, I don't know anybody that were egomaniacs. We were often con uh, accused of that. But I like to say, and it was definitely not ego, it was confidence. I was going to say supreme self-confidence. I think being in the cockpit alone gives you a sense of ownership of everything that you don't have in a lot of careers. Yeah. It, well, yeah, we had one stick in the F-14, one pilot. Right. You can't so, blame the other guy, even the Rio. So. Yeah. No, we worked really well as a, as a team. You had to, and that personality thing was something you tried to fit together as the commanding officer and the XO. You, and you know, you'd, you'd want to make sure that, that the pilot and the, and the co-pilot worked t together. How do they make those assignments? How do they decide who works with who? Are you just assigned? Personalities. Or do the, does the CO pick that or do yeah. you get to decide? Well, I'm sure that the CO, the XO, and the OPSO, they'd get together and, and figure all that out and say, yeah, this is good, that's not good. And then you'd be monitoring. You don't want, uh, you don't want conflict. You never, ever want conflict. Right. And you want to have, if somebody's weak, then you want to have the other guy a little bit stronger to pick up the, the, the slack, so to speak. So if you have a, a weak pilot, you want to have a really strong Rio to help him through some of the things. And then like, likewise, the other way around. That's one thing that surprised me in the second movie, I thought, is that 
uh, the female pilot, I don't remember her name, but she seems to be portrayed as extremely confident, but her Rio is kind of a goofus. Bob. <laughs> yeah. And maybe he's really competent and quiet, but he makes a mistake in the one run, and so he's portrayed as kind of a screw-up. And I was surprised, so why would they pick them for that role? Um, you would think you would pick the two best, I would think, at some point. But um, So they do assign really good Rios to help weaker pilots and vice versa. On crews, Yeah. You know, when you're, when you're actually detached, flying for real off a carrier, you're usually stuck with the same two people. And we'd have one of the pilots, or two, um, that, would, that would, they would put, that would allow him to fly with anybody. On my last cruise, I was the, the nomad. They just put me with anybody. <laughs> really? Yeah. What, what ships did you serve on primarily? The Kitty Hawk for uh, one cruise, and then the America for a med cruise, and then the Enterprise on the last cruise. Are you aware of the faith of the America? The America is gone, Kitty Hawk is gone, the Enterprise is gone. I'm still here. <laughs> there you go. F-14s are gone. <laughs> right, 747s are gone. <laughs> so in the movie, you always see missile lock. I'm curious, do you get missile lock only from radar-emitting missiles, or do you get them from heat-seeking missiles? Heat-seeking and or radar. Yeah, the, the the tones you hear in the movie are actually the sidewinder, the heat seeker. You hear this this growl. This taking a shot. Fire. Bingo. So it, missile lock from the person who's firing is one thing. Right. But often in the movie they say, "Oh, he's got me locked up," and it's like they know what the other plane's doing. I can see that for a radar missile. But I don't see how you can detect being tracked by a heat-seeking missile. You can't. But, they, but you do know when uh, ECM, electronic countermeasure, we, we, ECM um, gear on the airplanes, of course, they've vastly advanced between when I was in and now. And you would know when the radar was, was tracking or locked on. And it would have a, a different uh, frequency or bandwidth or whatever the radar so you'd have to know the other airplane's radar, of which engineers do that. Right. And then they would incorporate that into the ECM gear, so you'd get a tone to go, yep, we have a radar lock. But you didn't know if it was a missile lock. Okay, so to Does belabor the point, to fire a, even a heat-seeking missile, the aircraft has to establish a radar lock first, or no? No, okay. no. So no. a, a heat-seeker, like a sidewinder, can be fired with no sign of radar whatsoever? Correct. How does the other guy know what's coming then? He has to look. Okay. And it may it doesn't detect the launch, like the engine or anything like that incoming, or is it strictly? You'd you know, have to see it, yeah. Okay. You know, and Smoke then, in the air? It's, it's going at t t Mach 2.8. I mean, the time frame of when it goes off and, and hits you is, I mean, it's just tiny. Right. I don't, I don't know how you could get away from it. The only way to do it is to punch those flares out. And then the heat seeker grabs the locks onto the wrong thing. Not the airplane, the flare blows up. And that was portrayed fairly accurately in the movie. It was, although they seemed to fire chaff and flares at the same time, which maybe they had a scenario for that. But it, you would probably only use one or the other, depending on the type of incoming missile, wouldn't you? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, when, when we did it, we, we did both. Okay. Uh, only because y y we didn't really know. You, you, you can't program wh while you're sitting in the back seat. Okay, here comes a mus missile. Program it. You know, you just want to start punching them out. Right. Single button does them both at the same time? Or? Yeah. Oh, so does the computer know what kind of missile is inbound based on a signature of the radar and all that? Or is it pretty much up to you to decide what's coming in? I think uh, back then, no. Uh, that was what a lot of people really were working hard at to try to figure all that out. And it's, it was doable. Uh, it, and we actually, not only that, but uh, the, each engine was unique signature just because of the fan blades and the speed at which it's going around. So a radar reflection off of certain engines, we could tell what airplane it was. Okay. That technology was there, it was not incorporated when I was in. I'm sure it's there now. Right. And um, yeah, and same thing with, with radars. But the airplanes, you have to remember, don't have a lot of room and expansion for this, all this huge electronic equipment to figure all that stuff out. We would have uh, other airplanes for that. 
One thing that amazed me is I was on a carrier a couple of years ago, and there was an F-18 that was in for maintenance, I guess, because they had both engines out of it. F-18? I think so, yeah. Okay. And it was very hollow with no engines in it. It yeah. was You really get the sense of when they're there, you're strapped to two engines yep. as opposed to an airframe. So that is correct. the bulk of the aircraft was engine. That is correct. And you knew it. <laughs> um, that the was guys, the fun part. In terms of carrier launches and landings, that's my kind of next question. Um, for every time you land, somebody, there's a couple of guys stand at the end of the flight deck and they evaluate your landing. And do you rotate that position or how does that work? The LSO, landing signal officer. There's one per squadron or two per squadron. And they would rotate. Uh, they, you'd have to have, you didn't have to, but they would always have an F-14 LSO out there. But he would grade A-6s and F-18s or, or whatever. And then likewise, the, the F-18 squadron would have his LSO out there. And, but, but it was somewhat interchangeable. <clears throat> but we didn't have, you know, I'd have A-7 LSOs grade me. Okay. So it's not the airplane, it's, it's your flight path, if that makes sense. The LSO is mainly there for safety. So he knows you're out of whack. He'll give you the wave off lights and away you go. You see the wave off lights, you instantly add power and accelerate out of there. That's what their main job was. But they would also grade each landing on every pass. And it was posted in the ready room for everybody to see what your grade was. That's one of the things I'm wondering is that if you weren't doing direct air combat against your fellow pilots how did you stack rank and evaluate who was the good guy and who was the best and so on was it basically on landings or how uh, watching other guys fly or do you not even have a sense of who's really really good oh we knew uh, how do you know just just from flying with them uh but you know there's there's a strong point to everybody so many you know would do really good in phenomenal intercepts some people would do a acm really really well and, you know, some instrument flying really, really well. Some people could fly aboard the boat really, really well. So there are different combinations of aptitude, if you want to look at it that way. Very few pilots were good at all of them, as in really good at right. all of them. It's just the way it was. And it's usually the opposite. A good ACM driver was not a good instrument pilot. And likewise, the other way around. Instrument pilot was... was um, I don't know how to explain it. Is it. It's much more regimented. You know, you had to, it was, it was very exact. Whereas ACM, air combat movement, was um, seat of the pants, um, spatial awareness. That was the hardest thing, knowing where all the airplanes were. Right. And I got really, really good at it. I could write it all down in shorthand on my knee pad. And I could come back and debrief their air speeds, their headings, their head, and, you know, four... Four other airplanes, but it took a lot of practice. Right. But that's what I taught in, when I was a teacher. Okay. So you'd come back, write it on the, on the whiteboard and tell everybody. And, and if you were wrong, they'd tell you, no, nah, I was really headed this way or I was really a lot faster. But I was pretty correct. <laughs> One but, thing that you mentioned just a minute ago, and it's what I've been thinking about, is that in the movie, there's a scene, in the first movie, there's a scene where... Uh, I forget the guy's name, but he's all confused and sweaty and he's having a bad time landing. So Maverick is landing on his wing. Is this the first movie? This is the first movie, yeah. And it's one of the very original scenes and he comes in way too low and slow and somebody yells pull up. And I've never flown an airplane, but it seems to me that pull up is the wrong thing. You'd want to add power at that point. But I'm, I'm picking on the movie a little bit, but if you are coming in and you're trying to call the ball and you're obviously too low of a trajectory, what's the right move in that case? We, we flew, the Navy flew an attitude, which was actually an airspeed. And we would know within a, a one and a half knots of our, or three knots, whatever that, we'd have a, a, a light that it was green, amber, or red. Red was slow, and amber was fast, and green was right on. And that was duplicated outside so the LSOs could see your speed whether you're going fast or slow. If it's blinking between green and, and yellow, you know, you're, that's fine. Okay. But uh, it, it was actually measuring your angle of attack, which then related to airspeed. And that's what the ball does, the Fresnel lens or Fresnel lens? Fresnel. Fresnel, thank you. I knew it was a fancy word in there. It's, it's I'm not sure how it works myself, but I know it only lights up from the right angle when you look into it in the proper way. Or. 
you've pulled into a, a left turn lane at some road intersection. You can't see the left turn light until you get into the left turn lane. Oh, now I can see the light. Okay. Those are Fresnel lens. Okay. So they'd have, I don't, I, I can't, I don't know, 10 or 11 of those in an arc. So you can only see one at a time or part of one at a time, just like in the left turn lane on a road with a green light or a red light, you can't see it until you're in that lane. And are they color coded? So if you're seeing the wrong one, how do you know which one you're seeing? The right? bottom three or four, I'd, again, I'm, I'm not sure the numbers, the bottom Fresnel lights, the bottom ones were red. Okay. All the rest of them were amber or yellow. And then there was a datum lights were green. So if the ones above the datum green showed you that you were high, and if the one below it was on, then it showed you that you were low. And we could be, gosh, you know, these numbers. I know it was really narrow, maybe two or three feet over the, the round down. We knew where we were within two or three feet from looking at the Fresnel lens. And that's all mechanical optical. That's not electronic information systems. That's It's all so mechanical, yeah. yeah. Now that they did have uh, the Fresnel lens was uh, gyro stabilized to a certain extent. And even probably more so nowadays. Do you ever get used to a carrier landing at night? Or is it always sort of pucker factor? Uh, you ne it, it, no, you never get used to it. The daytime ended up being a lot of fun. It, once you do it a lot, you know, in the cruise, you'd get 100 traps. Nighttime was always, because your, your senses were totally, you're d devoid of senses. Right. Up and down and right and left. I mean, it, and you were, your body confused you all the time. If, if that's kind of hard to understand unless you actually lived through it. We know where bottom is because of gravity. And our ears tell us because of gravity. So if we turn, our, those three little circular things in our ear, and our ear moves the hairs in there and it tells us that we've turned. But if you stay in that turn long enough, then the, the fluid comes back, the hairs go back to neutral, and you're now convinced that that's the new straight up and down, or normal. So you get accelerized instead of velocitized almost. <laughs> yeah. So we, we call it the leans in the, in the um, civilian world, they call it vertigo. But I would, almost every night landing, I had the leans. You know, be 30 degrees off. I, the airplane, I can't remember now whether it was this way or this way, but I felt like I was in a, in a 30 degree turn every time. My body said I was in a turn, but I wasn't. But you said ignore that. Right. That's hard to do. And how long did that persist for? Uh, how long it takes to equalize those out? 30 seconds? I don't okay. know. You know, there was a, a certain time frame there. But the worst I ever got was I thought I was upside down when I wasn't. Really? Yeah. I was out over the doing night intercepts for with students in the back seat and um there was there were some ships on the water with their lights on and it was a clear night so we could see the stars. And you do these exotic maneuvers coming back for these intercepts. We had canned intercepts that we had to teach the, the, the new Rios. And so Late in the evening, all of a sudden, my brain just totally whacked out, and it, it flipped. And I knew I was upside down, and I just could not convince myself that I wasn't. I looked at the instruments, and I was right side up. Like, oh, this is not good. But I didn't. So you felt like you were in a perpetual negative 1G, being upside down. I felt like you are upside down physically. I didn't or? feel it. My body, my mind... My eyes, my body, everything in, that I've ever been used to is telling me I was upside down. It's kind of related to one of my other questions, about, <laughs> and I think I've asked you this before, and I didn't understand your explanation at that time, so I'm going to ask you again. And to me, it seems like if you take an aircraft and you nose it into a dive, kind of like an elevator in, an air, in a building, at some point you're going to feel zero Gs, if it's a fast enough elevator, and that that feels like the sensation of falling. And so to me, if you were able to... Uh, sustain that long enough like an orbit where you're always accelerating towards the earth at 1g it seems like you should feel weightless feel like you're falling at all times or is it only changes in acceleration that you actually feel you only feel the change in acceleration okay, okay go, go that's a very good uh explanation you're in an elevator just think of an elevator that's a couple thousand feet high if you will and it starts down and and accelerates 
is eventually to where you're floating. But you're looking at the elevator, and it, it still it hasn't moved a bit. So mentally, you're lined up with every visual representation that you were when you were not weightless. So you don't feel like you're falling. You just feel weightless. Yeah, and I have a hard time internalizing how those are different. but They're not different. But we, with our eyes and our brain, has never been wrong. Now, you can be drunk and fall, but you go, I know I'm falling. You're not wrong. You've never been wrong. So your visual representation of your world is very, very important. So you, if, as long as you got some visual representation, things are, you can be fooled. Right. If that makes any sense at all. And it's probably different for different people, too. I imagine. And it's hard to tell another person what a sensation is like. You know, it's yeah. like all the others. What, what is green to you? So. Oh, in the movies, they make a big deal of buzzing the tower. It seems like a career-limiting move, like you would get in a lot of trouble for doing it. Yeah. So not something that people do routinely. Um, you can do anything once in an airplane. But you get to keep your job. It, or, or die. Oh, but yeah. you can do anything once in an airplane. Yeah. No, you don't buzz a tower. You have to get permission for that. That would be a trip to the Admiral or a trip to the CAG. Or... I looked it up. Uh, Section 10, U.S. Code 910A. Anyone who willfully and properly hazards a vessel or aircraft shall be punished by death. Yeah, no, this came out of the U.S. Standard Code, which has surprised me a little bit, but uh, yeah, same we, as willfully disobeying a direct order is also, in yeah. time of war, punishable by death. Now, now you got me thinking, I'm, I'll think of that, and as soon as we walk out, I go, hey, I remember it now. <laughs> Text Cause, me. Because I, I was a legal officer. In, oh, really? And the, the uh, military falls in a totally different jurisdiction that way. We're not constitutionally protected, per se. Okay. Yeah, there's other things that we are held to that normal citizens are not. The difference between Top Gun, U.S. Navy Fighter Weapons School, and Red Flag. I don't know if two of those are the same thing and one is a third thing. That's my guess, but I'm not really sure. Top Gun, Navy Fighter Weapons School are synonymous. Okay. Red Flag is just a, a yearly, I don't know what it is now. I've been to quite a few Red Flags, a lot of fun. And it, it's a, a, a yearly event. We flew it out of Nellis and where all the the um, Army, Navy, Air Force, everybody gets together and they have a set program through, I think it's a two or three week uh, exercise where everybody gets to uh, exercise working together for, you know, different, different goals, different objectives on each flight. That's where I got to fly that F-16. Oh, okay. God, that was cool. We went in at, I don't know, 100, 200 feet in section and popped up. And, and um, rolled inverted. He targeted it, dropped the bombs, and then we skedaddled out of there. Pretty cool. That's something they don't explain very well in the movie, so I'm operating off an assumption that when they go over the mountain, they invert and then pull that way because I assume it's a lot better to pull positive Gs than negative Gs. A lot more comfortable. So I did the, uh, when I was 40, my wife bought me the fighter pilot for a day package. And I was actually paired up with a guy that knew you from F-14s. And I wish oh, I could remember his oh, name. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You told me about that. Um, he knew you. And I think at the time you might have remembered his name. But I can't tell you what it is now. I'd have to dig up the email. Yeah. But long story he was, short. He, he was, was in a, four, 114 with me. I can't remember oh, really? his name now. Yeah. Great guy. They're all great guys. Anyway, go ahead. It was an Italian fighter plane we were flying in. And... 6.5 or 6.8 was the most G's that I pulled, and then I started to destabilize my gyros, as he said it to the other pilot, <laughs> which I think it was his thinking that I was going to get sick. Well, it's I, not... I was okay until negative G's. I cannot, negative one G is, I don't want to hang over the bed and look for my slippers. So. Yeah, yeah. It, it's something you get used to. Uh, you know, when I pulled the 9.6 or 9.8, whatever it was, I'd been flying uh, really a lot for, I don't know, 10 days or five days. We were flying a lot anyway, but that particular uh, detachment that we were on is over in China Lake. We were flying a lot of ACM, a lot of heavy Gs, and you, you get used to it, and uh, you can work into it. So it's not fair to throw you in the backseat of an airplane and put six G's on you and say, hey, how does that feel? <laughs> right. It's just, it's just not really. So realistic. you do acclimatize over time a yeah, little bit. Yeah. You know, if the second time you went, you'd like really enjoy it. First time is, everything's too new. Right. Yeah. I hated that. 
I liked it, but I didn't like it. We used we'd take a midshipman flying, you know, out of the academy. They they want to go aviation. They go on a submarine, go on airplanes. They'd, they'd send them everywhere, and we'd put a midshipman in the back seat, send them through training so they could fly in the back seat. And it was a docile flight because you didn't want them to throw up. You didn't want them to feel bad. You wanted them to feel good about aviation. But right. it was not aviation of, a, of an F-14. But it just made sense. Um, we'd, go, I'd, we'd go supersonic, which is nothing. But they could say, yeah, I went supersonic. You'd do a loop, and they'd go, okay, that's enough. That's enough. <laughs> All right. But it, it really wasn't that much to it. Which is a shame, but if the second or the third flight, they would have gotten a lot more out of it. Would they do them off the carrier? No. Okay. No. Land based. I was going to say a carrier launch would be impressive. Self esteem <laughs> catapult, that would get your attention. Uh, yeah. You know instantly what's about to happen. And what is the takeoff speed on an F 14 when you're coming off the end? 140, <laughs> 160, something like that, I'm guessing, but. Well, I happen to know the minimum. Because I breached it one time, not intentionally, cold cat shot. Um, I think it was like 125, 130. I'm going to guess at that, right around there, knots. So that's 150, 160 miles an hour. And it's just slightly over a second, 1.1 or 1.2 seconds, something like that. It was actually the, the, the bigger ships, the Enterprise, I think it was 2.2 seconds to get to 160 knots. The older ships, they had a little bit shorter, and they were like 1.7, a little bit harder. Okay. The, the, the Kitty Hawk was a little bit harder. But you, there was no doubt. If you had this brake set, it didn't matter. You, you, you did have the engines on, it didn't matter. <laughs> you were going to go <laughs> off the end of the ship. Right. <laughs> um, on landing, it's my understanding you actually apply full power in case you miss the hook or don't catch the line. Miss the, hook, miss the cable. Yeah, as soon as you touch down, you go to full power. Okay. And you, you, we got really good. You, you, you'd time it so it, just when the cable would run out, you'd take the throttle back to idle so you'd have some sling back from the cable. If you kept the th throttle up at full power, when the cable stopped, you'd still have the cable hooked to the tail hook. And then it's some guy that'd come out with a crowbar bar and pull a cable oh, right. off. And so it, it fouls the deck for extra five or six seconds, which is a lot. But if you time it, and everybody did really good there at the end of cruise. You time it, you did pull it back just at the right time, and it, it, you'd come back. Cable would be free. You'd lift the hook. The guy would be sitting there telling you to put the hook up. You knew you were free of the cable, and off you'd go. And if, so if the, if, yeah, that's what you said, is if the hook missed or skipped, that was not uncommon. It would bounce over the cable. And is that where you set the low airspeed problem from a, a mist? Or you're saying it... Uh... Well, I had a cold cat shot. Yeah, what's that? The, uh, the cat, the catapult quit. Just oh, shut. not enough steam or something like that? Yeah, or, okay. about halfway down. So I had one second to figure it all out, which is not enough time. Right. That was the closest I came to ejecting. I was going to say, that's your only other option at that point, probably. So. Yeah, well, no. If the other option is what I did and lived through it. But everybody's yelling at me. I couldn't even get a word in. The captain of the ship was yelling at me. CAG was yelling at me. The air boss was yelling at me. Everybody was yelling at me. Next time you rotate on it, something's wrong with the catapult. I couldn't get it in. All I did was, of course, everything is relative. To me, the carrier did this. But, I mean, I was looking up at the flight deck like that. So, I mean, I knew that I was just didn't have enough airspeed to fly. So I just pulled back on the stick really, really hard, full buffet, stopped the rate of descent, and then actually pushed the stick forward about half a G so you could accelerate. So you have no induced drag on the airplane. It accelerates faster. Right. And then everybody's yelling at me on the radio. But I did it. <laughs> well, yeah, I was with Paul Sophie in the back seat. He and I paired up. He almost ejected us. What happens if, the, if one guy pulled, both guys eject? There's a, a handle in the back seat. He controls it because if the front seat ejects, the back seat always goes and always goes first because you don't want the front seat going out and burning the, the guy in the back. So if the front seater pulls his handle, the back seat goes, then the front seat goes. And they go at a three-degree angle because it goes so fast. Right. But there's a handle in the back where the um, back seater can put it in the 
aft position, and he will only go. The front seat stays there. I always flew in command position. I mean, uh, you know, so that the, the back seater, if he didn't like it, then he was going to take me with him. Okay. But now there was a couple of times in the rag when I was teaching, we had students in the back. I'd make sure that the handle was forward so that if he got chickened or whatever, yeah. who knows, he's gone, I'm not. So it was a different mindset each flight, whereas I commanded the flight, I mean, the, the, the ejection instead of my back. So it took one thing off my mind when I was with Paul or my regular Rio because they were a lot more in tune with what was going on. I'm concentrating on flying. If they thought it wasn't good, they're going to take me with them. Right. And you trust their judgment for that type of thing, obviously. So. Yeah. Absolutely. I've always wondered in the movie, in the first movie, there's a flat spin which they get into from jet wash and it wipes out one motor, which apparently is possible. I guess it's not how common that is, but apparently I've read the big, is it Pratt & Whitney? I forget who makes the engines on that one. Pratt & Whitney, P414. That they were susceptible to flame out from jet wash, but that could have been something I read in the movie too. So. The jet wash didn't do it. I mean, it's possible, but we've, I was witness to a flat spin, both of them ejected. The first flat spin, I can't remember, oh gosh, it might have been Mike Santangelo, I can't remember those guys' name. They were in the, um, the test and eval. They actually, and they had uh, a big uh, canards up front to make sure that it, they could get out of any spin. They were doing some spin testing with the airplane. And they got it up there, it's all on film, you know, telemetry, the whole bit. <laughs> And they got it into a spin. It was all very well coordinated, all orchestrated. And at 180 degrees per second yaw, the airplane goes, whoosh, the nose comes straight up and it stays flat the whole time. So that's doing about 300 degrees a second roll, I mean, yaw. And it's just absolutely, just so it's just going down like this. And uh, they were talking, you know, the pilot's really calm. It's like, oh. What happens is the airflow is no longer, the airplane's going straight down. The airflow is no longer going down the engine. It's coming from the side. So it starves it of the engine, it flames out. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. So the both engines quit. First off, the, the outboard engine is going to quit first because you've got the fuselage blocking everything. Right. And then the other one eventually quit also. And at, I think, I think it was at 10 or 9,000 feet, they ejected. And then very shortly after the airplane pops out of the spin and goes straight in. It's the same thing that happened. I saw, I witnessed out of the North Pacific. But it had tanks on it, drop tanks. It's a different aerodynamics of the plane. But it was inverted. Is there Flat a scenario spin. in which they, so they go to eject in the original movie, they pull a, or the canopy goes, and then, of course, Goose crashes into the canopy, but it seems very unlikely that the canopy would be there. But maybe in a flat spin, it doesn't get displaced enough. I have no idea. Well, that's where they got that from the movie, is that that actually did happen in that flat spin. They ejected. And the backseater glanced. You know, the canopy is, comes around you. So, and he just went through the, the center of it. It never hit him, touched him, or, but it was, it was close enough to him. So that Hollywood says, well, we can make this hit the guy and kill him and add right. this to the story. But even with no airflow going across, it's designed that way. No airflow to help the canopy depart the airplane. You're still going to miss the canopy. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, you're going to be sitting on the deck, not moving at all, pull the ejection handle, and both pilots are going to need to be ejected successfully. That's happened more than once. <laughs> Ready for a trivia question? Yeah. Uh, it was John McCain on the Forrestal, I think, that had a missile take off and then hit another plane. And I'm trying to wonder if he actually ejected from his mess in that point or he just was able to get out. He just got out. I don't think anybody ejected. It was um, a Huffer. Yeah, a Huffer is, is, is a, a, jet, a small jet engine that they bleed the air off of um, and then use that to start air start engines. That's how jet engines are started. They get air through them, start turning. And uh, the exhaust of that huffer was right on uh, a Zuni. It's a Zuni. 
Um, what is a zuni? Again? Yeah, they're they're rockets that, okay. that that just they're dumb though. They just you point it towards the ground and there's some you know you got to figure out what the angles are and it just fires off and hits the ground and blows up. It's very very rudimentary, but they, I think there were five inch zunis. Don't quote me on this. And they limited it to zunis to an inch and a half or three inches after that. That was part of the accident investigation. And I can't remember the number, but it was a, and I believe that's what, what the accident was. The Zunis went off, started, and uh, hit another airplane, and that right. caught on fire, and then caught another couple more caught on fire. Yeah, it was an incredible disaster. Yeah. And then the fuel started leaking below deck and caught that on fire, and oh, that can happen quick. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to appreciate that fire is probably one of your main risks on a ship, which is sort of a yeah, weird... you're pretty confined. Right. Speaking of on the ship, in the movie, they're always having meetings on the flight deck, out in the hangars, especially top-secret meetings, you know, to plan these missions. It seems like that was something you would do elsewhere, maybe not on the... No, that was Hollywood. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we always did it in the ready room. Uh, in the movie, they make a big deal of locker rooms. Is there a locker room where the pilots hang out, or is that... There was a, uh, on the ship, there was a locker room. Well, actually, in the squadron, there was also, you hang, hung your, your, all your flight gear, your G suit, your vest, boots, if you wanted to, you always wore your boots. Right. In the movie, they have a reason for testing out canyon runs, basically, because it's apparently required for that mission. But they practice them in actual canyons. I'm wondering what they do with actual canyons and risk of the aircraft for practice, or would you do it with waypoints? and simulate canyons, because they're actually flying canyons. We didn't have that automation. You know, so we flew the actual over the ground, you know, Under 1,500 feet and so on. Yeah. We weren't supposed to go below 500, but. So after the Navy, you moved into civilian aviation. Mm -hmm. Did you go to all Boeing jets at all time, or did you ever fly anything else? It was only Boeing. Not by choice, is how it happened. And what was your progression through the Boeing aircraft? First, uh, I flew the F-14. The very next airplane I flew was a 747. Really? Unusual. Very unusual. About uh, seven days into our class, the guy comes in to, at Northwest and says, well, you, this entire class is going to the 747 second officer. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was a good deal. And then I went from there to the right seat, co-pilot, and then from there to the left seat. Flew the 747 for 25 years. Did you really? Until they disbanded. They, they're all pedestals or razor blades. <laughs> we have some association with the one in the Smithsonian somehow, if I'm not mistaken. 6601, I flew that quite a bit. It was, a, it was the, one of the original 747s ever. It's actually number three off the, off the flight line, if I recall. And uh, the first two were used for flight and evaluation and testing. But Northwest got the first delivery of an airplane, 6601. And um, as it turns out, just by pure chance, that was the first 747 I flew in the left seat with. Oh, really? Yeah. We went up to Duluth and did bounces with it. So that's, What's a bounce? Uh, just touch and goes. Okay. We had to, the FAA was on because it was the first captain check out, and they wanted it. FAA was on board and they had to check us out. It's like no big deal. <laughs> I had lots of hours and takeoff and landings in it already. Six. So, what is the primary? Obviously, there's a ton of responsibilities in operating an aircraft that big. But where is what's your first thing you're worried about at all times in an aircraft that large? Fuel, weather. Temperature of the passengers. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Uh, side note to that question, Dave. I've heard uh, a number of people ask me, aren't you concerned with the passengers? Or it's so much easier in an F-14 because you don't have passengers. Think through that. Well, I imagine they're not bugging you an awful lot. but If I make it safely... The other 15,000 people behind me do, too. Or the one person. I don't know. I don't care how many people are behind me. If I'm safe, they're all safe, too. Right. So how many passengers meant zero to me. I just did everything 
to the best of my ability. If I live through it, so do they. Right. If that makes any sense. I never ever thought about the passengers. Oh, I got a, I got, oh God, there's 400 passengers. I'm so worried. No. Right. And no. I imagine if you're driving a school bus, you have a level of responsibility for the passengers as well, but just to try to get yourself there as well. So, and not yeah. die in an accident. And yeah. No. So flight planning, uh, weather was probably the biggest concern. Fuel was pretty easy because it was uh, very, the data for that was pretty exact. Uh, of course, what was not known was the, the winds and the weather. And so there was, that was always uh, up in the air, no pun intended. <laughs> Even the early 747s had some form of inertial guidance, I believe. Yep. Um, do you have to break the sextant out and look out the little window? Or? There was a sextant um, port in this original 747s. Why, did you know that? I did. Oh, okay. I've never heard of it being used, but I was curious if you were there at the time that they still had them. That was just as, uh, again, that's a 1960s air, airflame and technology. And uh, no, I'm, no, the sextants were not part of the equipment on the airplanes that I flew. Okay. <laughs> Nor did I know anybody that did. But it did have a sextant port. Right. You could pull it open and stick the... I uh, did a tour of the Atlas rocket facility down in Tucson, which is an amazing tour if you ever get the chance. And they still have the Atlas rocket in the silo, and they have all the old computers and everything else to do the launches. It's the same deal. To aim the rocket, it falls back on an alignment to a star, which it tracks during flight, or at least during launch. And they align it with a sextant, point it, fire it, and go. Because uh -huh. it's a fully mechanical system at that point. But Yeah. Uh, we had The F-14 had one INS. It's probably that I don't know if it was the same INS or not, but the the seven forty seven had three. Oh, really? And they all talked to one another. The three INSs talked to one another. In other words, they all three knew what the other two were doing. So if one of them started going cattywomp, it would bias that one out. But it always took an average, like mathematical, not mathematical average, but a logarithmic or some sort of geometric i don't know what you know some engineer <laughs> figured it out but it was not the exact center between all three it was some sort of algorithm that said this is where you are between the three and if one of them went really far south it didn't it assumed the other two were correct right it could easily have been those two that were incorrect it didn't know but less likely so um did you fly at 747 when they had all three people? All yep, three yep, yep. That's the only 747 I flew. I didn't fly the 400. Oh, really? So yeah. I didn't know that. How late did they have three people in the cockpit of a 747? 2010. I did not know that. That was the last time I flew one. I've never been on one, so. Never set foot on one, except at the uh, museum. So. 6601. Yeah. Uh, the 400 was a, a much better machine as far as for the pilots. And I would, I would have, but I had to commute to Detroit. And I go, no, no. Yeah, it'd be a long time to stay. So. Get there. I did that for a little, for like five months. And I, I go, no, no. I'll go to Hawaii before I do that. Because getting home, you'd fly all night, get to Detroit, and hopefully there's one seat available for you to get back to Seattle, get back to Seattle late at night. You're just, I mean, it's a killer. I go, no, don't want to do that. All right, well, here's some to go along with that if you want to. I saw five complete sunsets one night. Really? Yep. Fly along at 100 feet out over the water and over the ocean. Fly along at 100 feet doing, you know, I don't know, 400, 450, something like that, fast enough. And then watch the sun go all the way down, pull straight up, six and a half Gs, until the sun came back up again. Level off, watch the sun go down. And I did that five times. Five sunsets in one night. Right, that'd be amazing. <laughs> it was, I think it was 35,000, 37,000 feet when I finally said, nah, okay, that's enough. Running out of oomph and fuel. Sky fairly dark at that altitude or not? No. No different? Highest I've been was, I think it was 56 or 58,000 on the uh, test and evaluation. Changed the engine, you had to go out there and do all these tests. Okay. And um, part of that test was to go supersonic and zoom climb. And uh, you were supposed to stop at 45. We're limited to 50 only because we didn't have suits. Didn't have suits. Didn't have space suits, pressure suits. 
So above 55, 54, 56, I don't know, there's a number there. And it's obviously pressure dependent, not altitude dependent, at which water boils at 98.6. So you don't want to be out there hanging loose with water boiling at 98.6 degrees. Right. <laughs> That's why they limited it. But I, I, I just for the heck of it, zoomed up to it, and I, I limited it to 200 indi indicated. That was my limit because of the engines. The TF-30s were prone to failures. And um, so I wanted a lot of air going down the engines. I was still doing Mach 1.2. So it was like, and at 56 or whatever, 56, 58, it was, it was, you could definitely see the curvature of the earth. I mean, it wasn't like, right, you know, but you could definitely see, and it was black above and blue below. It was definite demarcation, but there was enough air to keep the engines going. So I was fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's the main thing. It took Mach 1.2 to do it, but. <laughs> I would imagine if you need a certain amount of airspeed to get lift, but the Mach number stays constant, even though the airspeed changes drastically. So you might, or is that true? So if you take off at 150, you're at about Mach, let's say a quarter of a Mach. Now, can you fly at whatever one quarter of the Mach number is at high altitude at that speed, is my question. <sighs> Not sure of the question. Um, so like as I said- less density, does air, air must speed, or this, the speed of sound in air gets slower as you get less dense. Is that correct? As you go higher, the mock, it's easier to get mock numbers. As you go higher, that's correct. Okay, because the air is less packed together, so it trans transfers the energy less well. So, yeah, I know it works backwards. You have to go to a mine shaft. Yeah, <laughs> mine yeah. Shaft that's, a, that's something I never really yeah, thought Yeah, I through. guess it makes sense intellectually that if the air was extra super dense for some reason, you could go a lot slower and still maintain a lift. I'm it's not a big revelation, but it wouldn't happen on Earth because you can't go anywhere more dense. So Yeah. Um, half the Earth's atmosphere is 18,000 feet. Is it half density at 18,000? Yep. And above 18 to 125,000 is the other half. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so your call sign was apparently Ripple. And I have no idea what... I looked. I spent a lot of time searching online. I could not find it other than the term of ripple firing multiple missiles from an F-14, and it that's, was in a paper. That's how I got it. Okay, so you tell me the story because I don't know it. The full uh, nickname was Ripple Finger. First off, you earn your call sign. It's, you don't just don't pick one. Right. Because we had nozzle, slough, smegs. You can guess some of those. Not to interrupt, but that's a good point. In the movie, they're all sexy, Maverick, Viper, Jester, but in real life, they seem to be appointed by other people and therefore not as... They're always appointed by other people. Right. Bozo. Um, <laughs> I mean, I can tell you the story behind all those, and they're good stories. Probably not for this, but... <laughs> so, uh, in, in the RAG, as a, as a student, before I go out to the fleet, we had to shoot a live missile. It's just one of the criteria they said you had to do. To set up a live missile shoot out over the coast in the Pacific, a lot of coordination. First, you had a BQM, which is a radio-controlled air airplane, and then uh, the, the airspace to make sure no other airplanes. You had to, I mean, there was a lot of coordination involved. Right. Okay, so they put two missiles on each airplane. They didn't care if you hit anything or did anything. It just you had to shoot one. Just before we man up. They, they give me the airplane. They said, we picked uh, the airplane for you. And they, they put a, an old World War II um, canister, a 16-millimeter canister gun film, gun camera. I'm not making this up. F-14, 1975, the World War II gun camera. We didn't have gun cameras. They later put VCRs in the airplanes. Really? Which makes more sense. But we didn't have any feedback. On, uh, on on anything, there was you just did it, and then you come back, and well, I don't know, I don't know what I did. So that was one of the things they were trying to push for was to get some sort of feedback for the pilots. So they put a, this gun camera in this the, the rag airplane, and the guy that gave it to me gave me the camera. He's pushing it; it'd be really obvious. And he says, "Put everything at zero except for f stop. Put that at f eight. Well, I'd already been taking pictures since I was seven years old. I had a camera. I knew what f stop. I knew all that." So I thought, okay, that's easy enough, F8. And um, there was uh, one of the other, other switches was OVRN. 
So this missile comes off. It's an AIM-9C, old, one of the original. I mean, it's old. And that's how it got its name. It did this okay. weird loopy through Sidewinder. The new ones don't do that just because of the guidance, the way it, it guides. And um, it, a pure pursuit guidance, archaic, but it works because it's going Mach 2.8. <laughs> So we get all sidled up, and I get the tone, everything's fine, we get clearance to fire, and uh, the BQM is in a big turn, and I'm pulling in, and I get the tone and pull the trigger. And now this missile is like from here to, you know, less than that on the wing right. pylon. It doesn't drop and then fire, it physically flies off the rail. Okay. It, the engine ignites, and it is. G O N E. I mean, it is instantly at Mach 2.8 or whatever it is. And the noise is deafening. Canopy, headset, earmuffs, the whole bit. This ball of fire comes off the rail and it's just this loud noise. Well, clearly I'll let go of the trigger. And then I thought, okay, I just got to make sure I keep the trigger down. So I pulled the trigger again. Whoosh! There goes the <laughs> other one. <laughs> so. The Ordy's guys were really happy. They were ecstatic. I taxied all the way in. No missiles. Yeah, they didn't have to do, take anything off. So we get back. No gun camera film because it was set at zero. I let go of the trigger. I said, I'm done. No gun camera film at all. And both missiles were stupid. Didn't hit anything. So hence my name, Ripple Finger. <laughs> Shortened to just Ripple. That is the only context in which I could find the word Ripple and F-14 together anywhere yeah. on the entire internet was that essential story. So. Yeah. Oh, in the movie, quite a bit, you'll see them driving around, driving, flying around, <laughs> talking with their oxygen mask take off. But I would seem to be really loud in there, wouldn't it? No, you don't do that. That's Hollywood. You right. have to see who's talking. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, like if they made a NASCAR movie today, they would have to do open face helmets because yeah. they want to see all the actors' faces. So they have yeah. to come up with some justification no. for that, I'm sure. Well, because you could talk to the other guy, you know, the, the guy in the back. You had to be able to con converse. You know, every once in a while, I'd take it off just in a non-stress situation up at altitude, who knows. But you, we wore it all the time. It was 100% oxygen, and, it, and as soon as you got in there, you put your mask on, and you're breathing 100% on oxygen for the whole time. Have you ever done snuba or scuba? Yeah, yeah. Love it. I haven't done it in a long time. I've only done the uh, where you are on the hose, so that you've got limited depth of 25 feet or 30 feet. So That's cool. But that's all you really need, because you don't need to be certified in that case. So. Right, right, right. So you haven't done scuba then? No, it's snuba. <laughs> <laughs> you've done I've done snuba. That's what it's called, snuba. Did you talk about chatter? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah, that was, that's something that comes up in the movies quite a bit. Is It's for the I get the reason to do it in the movie, but there's a lot of... He's right on my tail. Oh, no, this is going on. It's all on the radio, and everybody back on the ship is listening to this play-by-play -play of what's going on. And I'm wondering, is there that much radio chatter, or is it limited to missile away and splash one, or is there, like, play-by-play -play action going on? When, when I was, when I, I don't know the new procedures and all, but when I was in, um, they, they, at certain times, yeah, there was quite a bit of chatter. You would, you would be talking back and forth to the other airplane and, of course, to your Rio. So they would... You know, he'd hear everything whether you push the mic button or not. That's my other question. Is your communication to the Rio broadcast or recorded or? No. Okay. We had a, we'd go up hot ICS. Um, so we'd, What's it, ICS? Inner cockpit system. I don't know. Okay. That's a good question. I don't know what it stands for. Talking to the other guy. Yeah. So, so it, was, it was like an intercom. You talk back and forth. He'd stay, so I wouldn't have to push any buttons or control, you know, the, the, the hot mic. You know, I'd just go hot mic, so one switch, and then, and, and then we'd st stay that way in, in combat or heavy situations. Or, and then, of course, you had to push the switch to talk out. So I radio. have a theory that I want you to, this, this is stupid, but humor me for a moment. On a commercial airliner, like a 747, when the pilot comes on, they'll classically do the, and the weather today, uh... And I'm wondering, when they're doing that, are they keeping the mic keyed with their voice, or is the mic keyed physically? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain, Glenn Quagmire. Uh, we're looking about a four-and-a-half-hour flight time today. Uh, we've got clear skies, good visibility. Uh, we've got some very strong headwinds, giggity. 
No, they, they have to physically key it, the mic. Okay, so my theory was that they always keep the sound going in order to keep the mic keyed automatically, but that's not the case, so we'll edit this out. Don't worry about it. Okay. Well, most aviation is metric or not? Everything is centigrade. We'd always have to convert. But you're doing knots and centigrade. Yeah. It's kind of odd. You're not doing kilometers per hour. You're doing no, knots. So you're knots. doing a mix of metric and imperial. I mean, that's what I grew up with because I grew up with yeah. imperial. And then I switched to metric when I was like eight. And then I, I moved here when I was 20. So I've done it all three times. So. Right, right. It, 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 feet and inches. Who came up with that? The king. I know. <laughs> yeah. It's but, my foot. You know, where did Fahrenheit come from? Uh, the internal temperature of a cow is 100 Fahrenheit. That's what he based it off of. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'll have I don't to check know. that. But. I don't know. I've looked it up, and finally I said, I, I, I don't know. This dude spent a lot of time putting thermometers up cows' butts, and they all read 100. Because you know. cal- he needed a calibrated reference scale, and he was on fire. I, I, I think that's I'll the story. I'll take your word for it. You should tell that story, even if it's not true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I, but knots has always been a nautical ship aviation, for whatever reason. And I thought that knots comes from they actually tied a knot in ropes and fed them out at a certain rate and then you could tell every shape you drag a line behind a ship and the number of knots per minute that went out calculated your speed this is like in the 1700s long wow. before your time but i'm gonna have to look that up i i i'm, I'm what's, what's kilometers based on it's you know the equator to the north pole is well, it's all based so off many. of millimeters and so on, but I don't know what the basic way a meter is special. What? Well, Do you know what a meter is from? I don't even remember. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so many angstroms of light, but there's something. But not, knots, knots is uh, <clears throat> a distance. Yeah, you're never a knots for distance, are you? Because you're not 20 knots from here. That's. Are you 20 nautical miles? Is that different yeah. than a. It's 20 nautical miles, yeah. So um, a nautical mile is different than a 5,280 feet mile? Correct. Okay. It's different. Did not know that. And now, how does that relate to the height of the pyramid? <laughs> the most perfect geometric design is sphere. Yeah, in 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 every way. Sort of the simplest. Yep, yep. A lot of people say pyramid. A lot harder to explain as pyramid than it is to say all points at a particular distance from another point. All right. You don't have to name any names, but does anybody stand out in your mind as the best pilot? Was there one person that was above everybody else, or whereas if they're so close at that level that I, I really don't. I really can't say. I, I, I would if I, but we didn't, we all had our own and we all worked together. It was not a confrontational in any way. And um, the, only, the only thing that you couldn't really teach was flying aboard the ship at night or daytime either. No, there was not one person that um, really stood out. Some people excelled, like uh, Heater, Heater Heatley. Great guy, and he he worked really hard at, at changing the paint scheme on the airplanes. He was an airborne photographer. I did too. Took a lot of airborne, but he took pictures of the airplanes while they're in, in the air, and he goes, "This is ridiculous." And he got the, the airplanes to be changed in paint instead of that gray. Right. Yeah. So you know, there were some people that had talents and and utilized those. Uh huh. Well, it's it's a nice environment when you've got people with different skills everybody kind of brings a different tool set to work and so sometimes you can solve things that you can't if everybody's wearing this or using yeah. the same tools it, it wasn't we had to check in at eight and leave at five there was none of that it was get the job done and then of course aviation was you know part of it i've hired a disproportionately high number of military people for my own companies and in that time i have found particularly amongst navy and marine people that I fit very well with them because there are no excuses later. There's always, if you say something needs to happen, it generally does happen or you'll be told in advance that it won't happen. You don't get two days later, well, I left a voicemail with that guy and he hasn't got back to me yet. And I always appreciated that level of accountability. And somebody once explained it to me when I was on a carrier and they said, you know, when I was one year into the Navy, I got to run this carrier at night on the helm and the bridge or whatever and steer this thing or whatever he, whatever his responsibilities were but he was not very far into the Navy when he got to do it he said in the Army you got a Jeep I mean I'm sure he was being very uh, unfair to the Army but it certainly gave the impression that in the Navy you got an immense amount of responsibility especially for the equipment that you were entrusted with oh yeah yeah it's it's huge and you know it you don't have to be told right 
It, it's very obvious. And people took it very serious, which was, how do you, as a, as a manager, manage somebody who's basically in jail? They've signed a contract. They can't get out. You're on cruise. They can't go home. They can't go to the store. They can't watch TV. They can't go to the movies. They're, they're, they're a captive audience. How do you motivate somebody like that? How do you get somebody like that to, to, to do what's necessary? That's not easy. You know, in the civilian world, I found out, well, you're substandard, you're out of here. Well, half these guys would be glad to say, you're out of here. Um, that was a different challenge than right. I, as a manager of people, which is a different than aviation. But Random question for you. I noticed in civilian aviation, captains have shoulder epaulets with four bars or on the sleeve with four. Mm -hmm. what are, are, are there four gradations of pilot or is it? How does that work? Do people have one, two, three, and four bars, or is uh, three and and uh, four? Three was co-pilot and second officer, and then four was the captain. Okay, and that's a that's a good question. I know the Navy was four stripes as a captain, and maybe that's where they got it from. You know, it's interesting. It, within five minutes, we knew everybody in the cockpit, whether they were civilian, Navy, Air Force, or Marine. It 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 took. It, but that's the, and then that was it. Once you knew it was over, and everybody was just a pilot. Oh no, no, no! We ragged the heck out of the Air Force guys, and then the Air Force guys ragged the heck out of the Navy guys. No, that's just part of the esprit de corps of. It was all done in fun and jest, and oh yeah, oh no! It was that's the rivalry is constant, you know. One thing I always admired about you was that you didn't show up at Albertsons in your flight jacket, but I assume you still have one. Oh yeah. And I, I always admire the fact that you were not putting that in people's faces. You know, you didn't have your license plate tag say, I'm an F-14 Tomcat pilot no. and stuff like that. So I always enjoy that about you. Yeah, it's, it, I went back to a squadron get together four years ago down in San Diego. And it was like we'd never left. Hadn't seen each other in 30 years. And just like yesterday. Right. You know, it's, it's a supreme decor. You, you can't describe it. Either you, either you have it or you, or you don't. I mean, and if you do, you don't need to talk about it. Right. Because if you do, people don't understand it anyway. So That's what's true. the point? But uh, the, the guys that flew aboard a carrier at night, it's pretty hardcore. It is. Well, I really appreciate all the time taken <laughs> answering all my questions and everything else. I know a lot of them are naive, but I, it's not my field, so... I appreciate you answering them, and hopefully that uh, my naive questions will serve other people who don't know the expert answers offhand. Yeah. No such thing as a dumb question. It's one of the first things you learn. Successful people right. learn. <laughs> no, no, that was good. You had Obviously, you have done your homework and looked up a lot of information in order to ask those questions. Well, I really appreciate you taking all the yeah. time out of your valuable schedule. and visiting us and uh, giving us all the information because it says again i started a lot of naive questions and i appreciate getting answers to them so well they weren't naive thank you so much for having me it was always good to see you dave yeah, it's you been too. too long it has been told so. you we was going to buy you a cup of coffee we never made it work mm -hmm. well now we had two beer each so. yeah well i had <laughs> one beer oh i had two so. <laughs> if along the way you found today's episode to be any combination of entertaining or informative i'd be honored if you'd consider leaving a like and subscribing to my channel if you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then. Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. This little chair will be waiting for one of you, and a rocking chair for another who likes to rock, and a big armchair for two to curl up in. All next time on Dave's Garage. <laughs>